the hand up of the top that sort of looks like almost like a maestro. We wanted to see the machinations of the shadow puppetry. Like usually they would either, it either be more invisible when they do it or they would get rid of it in post. But we really wanted to, to show that these stories are, yes, based on things that have happened, but also a creation of people as they tell it and as it morphs and changes through history. So that like <laughs> moment of the hand there is just, just to even further show like, you know, this is, um, we kind of are all, all puppets, you know, in a way. Hi, I'm Nia DaCosta, and I'm the director of Candyman, and this is my scene breakdown. So this is our um, shadow puppet sequence that goes through a couple of the different men and a boy who've been Candyman. And the first one is Sherman, who we see a lot of in the film. And this is all practical, cut out paper, shadow puppetry done by an amazing company in Chicago called Manual Cinema. This scene in particular is taking place in Cabrini Green. We also see this moment in the film itself and portrayed in, in, with actual actors. This is just another way of looking at it. And it kind of points to why we wanted to do shadow puppetry in the first place, because we wanted to we wanted it to be the medium of the storytelling, of the passing on of the lore. So even within some of this, like the, the details aren't exactly the same as what was in, in the film, just to show that like the teller of the story is just as important as the story itself. In between each sort of representation, you see Anthony painting because it's we're kind of showing like he's in a way kind of seeing these men and, and being um, influenced by them. This is one of my favorite shots in the um, shadow puppetry sequence with everyone outside the, the window staring in. Uh, I think it's so eerie the way the eyes are cut out and um, it was really fun coming up with the, the way people would look in, in the shadow puppetry with manual cinema. They're super creative, brought so much brilliant, um, inspiring imagery to the table. Um, and then we kind of honed it together and came down to you know a specific look for, for all of these. I think that image for me like is so potent because it is what the movie's about. It's like the violence from the mob. And I think that imagery was so clear and everything about it just really encapsulates like the sort of hatred and the violence that is inherent in that sort of mob mentality. So I think that might be my favorite sort of shot from this. Um, but overall, I think my favorite like vignette is, um, is the kids because it's the most heartbreaking to me. This we did a lot of editing with, like a lot of back and forth with Mano Cinema, like how best to, to tell the story. Um, and a lot of people picked up on that he was inspired by um, George Stinney Jr., who was the youngest person at 14 to be executed by the state. And a, and a detail from his true story, but that we did not want to use here, was that he was so small that he had to sit on a Bible in the electric chair. And so, I mean, that's a big reason why we went with shadow puppetry, is like we didn't want to put people through this like with actual people and and besides it connecting to like you know storytelling and how how old it is and, and this being an old form of storytelling we wanted to um um also kind of have a filter between the horror of what's happening um and the audience So what you're seeing is him painting, meeting this woman, and they fall in love. Um, there was actually, <laughs> there was actually like a, a sort of sequence where they're like, not like making out, but like he's like on top of her and it's supposed to be very romantic. And I was like, I cannot have puppets even alluding to having sex. So I will not be <laughs> including that <laughs> in this. <laughs> um, and I also wanted to, to be very specific and like, you know, make sure we stayed on, on, on topic. This is our version of depicting the, the Robitaille story. It's also spoken in the film, which for me was really important to have a black man telling the story of Danny Robitaille as opposed to the first film where it's a sort of uncaring white academic. At the end of this, we have Anthony sort of himself 
in a way becoming possessed by the stories, by this, this history, by the weight of it. Shadow puppets were very, very, very beginning of the process. Um, we're, there's always gonna be shadow puppets in the film. The way we use them, um, we developed throughout the shooting um, and we added even more after after we finished shooting because we were like, this <laughs> this is great and we can we can do more with it. So, so yeah, it was sort of like, we always knew we'd use it and then how we used it and how much we used it um, developed as we were shooting and in post. Kara Walker was obviously a huge influence, not necessarily in deciding to do Shadow Puppets, but in envisioning how it could be very eerie and connected to history, and specifically black history. Another artist whose work was influential was Lottie Reiniger's work. She did a lot of silhouette animation, equally as eerie and disturbing. So, so that was great, I think, in just showing, like, we can do this in a way that's really evocative. But when it came to the actual, like, what's in the film, manual cinema really came up with their own, own language, and we, you know, we, we created something specific to, to our story. The hand up of the top that sort of looks like almost like a maestro. We wanted to see the machinations of the shadow puppetry. Like usually they would either it either be more invisible when they do it or they would get rid of it in post. But we really wanted to to show that these stories are, yes, based on things that have happened, but also a creation of people as they tell it and as it morphs and changes through history. So that like <laughs> moment of the hand there is just, just to even further show like, you know, this is um we kind of are all, all puppets, you know, in a way. You know, we really shift the point of view in uh, in in our film from the first one, and and we really pull apart like the the mythology of Candyman. We kind of look into like what makes a myth and who gets to decide what the myths are, who gets to decide who the villains are, and and the martyrs and the monsters, and and that was something that was really compelling to me as we you know constantly deal with black people getting killed um, in horrifying ways in this country. So um, I think that's something that we really wanted to examine. Um, I think the first movie is really preoccupied with, you know, Cabrini Green and gang violence and like graffiti and like things like that, or like very like present things. And then we wanted to kind of talk about the cyclical nature of what happened to Danny Robitaille as a person um, and how that affects the community today. Um, so yeah. A couple weeks later, more razor blades and more candy. He'd been innocent. So he's real. Candyman ain't a he. Candyman's the whole damn hive. Thank you for watching The Scene Breakdown. Please check out Candyman and get your tickets on Fandango.